Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Jed Crandall from UC Davis. Jed is a PhD candidate uh, uh, from the security group of UC Davis, and he's going to uh, his area of interest is, is in uh, system security. Uh, with uh, uh, Jed, particular has a architecture uh, background, and today Jed is going to tell us about two security tools that he's built over his PhD uh, dissertation topic. The first two is Dakota for analyzing the malware. The second two is uh, related to temporal search, uh, which is going to look for the time bomb in the malware. Okay. All right, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me today. And what I'm going to talk about today is not just how, uh, I want to talk about how we can deal with emerging malware threats, the you know kind that we haven't seen yet by not only looking at the malware that we have, but also understanding the, the systems that the malware spreads on and the interactions between the two. So it's an overview of my, my general research philosophy. I don't see security as a problem to be solved by me, but it's a, a battle that needs to be waged by antivirus professionals and you know, next generation security technology developers. So then my, my goal as a researcher is to give them the tools that they need, both in terms of implementations of actual useful techniques that they can use and theory that's firmly, granted in, or firmly grounded in practice so that they can uh, apply that to the situations that they face. And then in particular, how can we address these emerging threats like polymorphic and metamorphic worms and botnets and cryptovirology? I'll talk a little bit about what that is, or advanced rootkits. And the problem is we don't have many real-world samples of these to look at because they're sort of you know, threats on the horizon. So my solution is that why don't we look at the samples that we do have and the way those interact with the systems and try to understand the systems and the interactions between them, and then we can build a model of what's possible for these future malware threats. And a quick outline of the talk. First, I'll just go over Code Red 2 as an example to define some basic terms and concepts that I'll use throughout the rest of the talk. And I'll very briefly talk about Minos, which was a, it started as an architecture project. That's what we're going to use to catch the worms. And then we're going to analyze the worms using Dakota. And we want to understand how much polymorphism and metamorphism is possible during the exploit part of the, the worm. And then I'll talk about temporal search, which is we're looking for time bomb attacks. You catch a worm or a virus, you want to know, is this counting down some event in the future? Like it's going to delete all your files on the third of the month or something like that. And then we'll look ahead a little bit. I'll talk about the future research I want to work on. So I'll use Code Red as an example for uh, define some concepts. So it infected hundreds of thousands of hosts. And one company estimated that it was billions of dollars in cleanup. And in temporal search, I'll talk about how it attempted a denial of service on the White House. And they were able to avert this because it was a hard-coded IP address. So they just changed the IP addresses before this was set to occur. And I'll, I'll use sort of Code Red and Code Red 2 interchangeably throughout the talk. The, the exploits are basically the same. So if I say one when I mean the other, then uh, it, it really applies to both. So my stepmom asked me one time about her web TV. She said, it's just sitting there. How can someone break into it when it's just sitting there? And that's actually a really intelligent question when you think about it. So the way these worms spread is it's a vulnerability in you know, a server implementation. And uh, so that there's different phases. So say this is the code red worm on one web server. It wants to attack the, the web server over there, over there on the right. First, it'll put itself into the web server's memory. And then so the web server in its memory might have contiguous to a buffer where it's going to store the git request, uh, a pointer to the next code that it intends to run when it's done receiving the git request. So a buffer overflow attack, which is a, a sort of typical memory attack. You would just send a git request that's longer than the buffer and you overwrite that pointer to, to run the worm code next instead of the code that's supposed to run on the web server. But the important point to take away from this is that before that control flow hijacking occurs, the worm has to conform to the HTTP protocol and it has to go through the protocol that's implemented on the web server. And so if we look at the Code Red 2 exploit and how this works, it, you can see it has to go through the HTTP protocol. It's going to send a GET request. And there's these Unicode encodings. And these X's up here, when you convert everything to Unicode, uh, 
they're going to be two characters instead of one, so the buffer turns out not to be long enough, and there's a structured exception handler on the stack. And this value, which we're going to call gamma, that's the bogus control data, this overwrites that structured exception handling pointer so that when there's an invalid Unicode character at the end here, the, uh, the web server will say, oh, no, there's an invalid Unicode character, and try to call the structure exception handler for that. But that value is overwritten, and now you're running the code red worm on the stack. And so uh, when we were catching actual worms using Minos and then we were analyzing them, we realized that sort of the conventional notions about you have a not sled and you overwrite their turn pointer, they didn't really apply to, to most real worms. So I came up with this model, which basically... Uh, over in green, you have the attack trace. Which this is the actual trace of assembly instructions that the server is running while you're attacking it. And then the attacker sends network packets, and the, the packets don't mean anything until they're actually interpreted on the network trace. So epsilon is the exploit vector, and this is where the, the worm is going through the HTTP protocol and trying to set up the condition where you know, it's going to hijack control flow through something like a buffer overflow. And then pi would be the payload that it's going to run after it hijacks control flow. So what happens is that gamma is something that overwrites, like it can overwrite a return pointer on the stack, or we saw with code writer, it overwrites a, a structured exception handling pointer. So all of these are mappings, epsilon, gamma, and pi, they're mapping the, network's pa uh, the attacker's network packets onto the attack trace. And so this is going to cause a bogus control flow transfer. And after that, you're running the worm code. You're not running the... In green would be you know the the web server code that you're supposed to be running. So back to our example of code red, the exploit vector epsilon would map these bytes. So this is you know the actual protocol that the web server is going to be processing as you're attacking. And gamma is the bogus control data. So this is that fake structure exception handling pointer there. And then pi would be the payload. This is what you run after you, you hijack control flow. So this code is just going to find the rest of the code red code that's on the heap and execute it. So our, our motivation for, for creating the epsilon gamma pi model, uh, one thing is that there's different polymorphic and metamorphic techniques. I'll talk about what polymorphism and metamorphism are. And the, the, the techniques are different for epsilon, gamma, and pi. So epsilon metamorphism would be you, you attack a different way. And then polymorphism is you change bytes that don't even matter. Whereas for pi, it's you know the more traditional polymorphism, metamorphism, where polymorphism is you're encrypting the code body, and metamorphism is something like you're, you're doing binary rewriting on the, the x86 machine code. And another motivation, the reason that epsilon, gamma, and pi, we view those as mappings and not as just sets of bytes in the network, is that uh, the data can be represented differently on the network than where it's used on the attack trace. So the, the gamma for code red, the structure exception handling pointer, it's Unicode encoded coming over the network. So that top line is what it looks like coming over the network. But then the, the actual pointer is stored in a little Indian format in, in the x86 before it gets used will look like that. So this way we can be more perspicuous about exactly what we're talking about. And the main motivation is that information only has meaning and that it's subject to interpretation. So the attacker's network packets are meaningless until they're actually interpreted by the, uh, the, the server that's being attacked. So one thing that people have proposed for stopping internet worms is uh, you, know, you just have a network signature. So you could take this string and just look for that string and not allow that to propagate over the network. And that's where polymorphism and metamorphism came in. So these polymorphism and metamorphism will change successive instances of the worm so that signature-based uh, network defenses fail. So for, for polymorphic, you want to think syntactic. So you're just changing bytes that don't matter. And metamorphic, think semantic. So you're, you're exploiting the vulnerability in a different way. And I'll define those formally within the epsilon gamma pi model. Uh, some researchers call both polymorphism, but we think that the distinction is important because with metamorphism, you're taking a different trace to the attack. So for Dakota, we're only going to look at a single trace. Whereas for any vulnerability, there's different ways that you can exploit it. So there's different traces you can take to that condition. So now I have a question for the audience. If you were going to create a network signature, uh, what would be the best place to find invariants that can't be changed using polymorphism? Would it be uh, epsilon, the exploit vector? Or gamma, the bogus control data? Or pi, the payload? Gamma, pi, epsilon, pi. <laughs> 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 yeah,
Okay, so yeah, we're, we're going to focus on epsilon in, in the talk today because the the polymorphic and metamorphic possibilities of pi are endless. So this is the same kind of you know self-modifying code and code encryption that you would see in viruses. And as far as gamma, there was a project at UC Davis called Buttercup, where the idea was take that bogus return pointer and use that as your signature. And one thing we found out when we were looking at real worms that we caught with Minos is that there's these things called register springs. And if you're interested in that, there's more details in the Dimva paper. And uh, basically what this means is that for the blaster worm, for example, there's about 11,000 possibilities, you know, possible values you could use for gamma. And then for slammer, there's 353. So that's why we're going to focus on epsilon in this talk. So now, what, what's the difference between polymorphism and metamorphism? So polymorphism is any time you're not changing the attack trace that goes to you know the buffer overflow or whatever the vulnerability is. You're just going to change the bytes that don't matter. So polymorphism and epsilon would be you change all these bytes. The, the blue is the tokens of you know things that the web server is actually going to process, and everything else you can pretty much change arbitrarily. So that would be polymorphism in epsilon. And metamorphism would be you're, you're running a different trace, so you can take things out, you can add things, you, you attack the vulnerability in a different way. So you can even put encodings in there that weren't there before. You can, you know, uh, ASCII encode gamma instead of Unicode encode it. And we would call that metamorphism. The important distinction of metamorphism is that you have some attack trace to the vulnerability. And like I said, different traces, that would be metamorphism of epsilon. So, but before we get into the code, I'll talk about Minos a little bit. Minos is what we're going to use to catch the worms. It started as an architecture project. So this was a tagged architecture that tracks the integrity of every memory word. And the basic idea is uh, you tag as low integrity anything that comes off the network, and then you follow those tags as you process. And then any kind of control data, return pointers, function pointers, jump targets, if they're low integrity, then that's an attack. So we flag that. And we, we track, we taint track with every instruction. So if you add two numbers, if either one of them is low integrity, then the result is low integrity. And this is great for catching worms. We actually implemented this as a virtual machine. And then for both Linux and Windows, we can use that gamma mapping and run honeypots and actually catch worms. So in terms of the implementation, it's a full system tag virtual machine. And then for Linux, we actually modified the kernel. So we can track the integrity as data goes to the file system and comes back. And then we also implemented virtual memory swapping of the tag bits. And for example, that's used, our implementation is used by a, a project at Stanford where they actually took an open source Spark, Spark processor and added tag bits and then burnt that to an FPGA. But the one we're going to use today is the unmodified Windows one where we just tag as low integrity anything that comes from the network card. And so this is how we catch the worms. This is in my apartment. We just run virtual machines on these machines. And we just put them up and then wait for Minos to catch a worm. You know, when Code Red comes along, the, the virtual machine will, uh, you know, spit out to the debugger whenever the attack is detected. And uh, so we run everything on a hub so that we can see, you know, if there was an attack that Minos hadn't caught, then we would have seen it in the network traffic. We would have seen anomalous network traffic. So we've caught, we think, everything that came our way. So we've caught Code Red. Zotob, Slammer, Blaster, Sasser, all these worms that have been going around for years now. And then only one false positive in two years, but it actually turned out not to be a false positive. It's just my cat that likes to sleep behind the machines for the heat. <laughs> and so, like I said, we did a full system evaluation, and so there's various related works and follow-on works, and there's at least one commercial product that uses the basic idea behind Minos, so it's really important to get things right. And this is just an example. Every, every exploit that we looked at had its own little idiosyncrasies. So for Code Red, if you don't taint table lookups as it's doing the, the Unicode uh, translation, then you won't catch Code Red. So th this is why it's important to uh, do a full system evaluation and then use real attacks because you discover these things that if you just work it out on pencil and paper you wouldn't realize. But more importantly we were able to build Dakota on top of it because it was a full system virtual machine. So Dakota... Can I ask a question about yeah, sure. mm -hmm. Could you comment on the potential false positives in your system? Potential false positives. Potential false positives? Um, so there, there could be a problem with like just-in-time compilers and 
So we, we actually, for Linux, made a just-in-time compiler mode where it just changes the policy a little bit, and then we were able to run the Sun just-in-time compiler. For Windows, we have it in just-in-time compiler mode all the time, compatibility mode, but it's not really a, that much of a security concern because you're still able to catch all the worms. But I can't, because Minos was originally designed to be, you know, not an intrusion detection system, but actually an architecture to protect you. So we, we you know, through testing, tried to make it, you know, virtually zero false positives. So. Checking for control flow hijacks, right? Yeah. So if you have a non control flow ordering attack, oh, like a false negative, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's going to give you false negatives, right? Yeah, so there, yeah, there's false negatives, definitely, yeah. Didn't you document a protocol that basically like, did this as part of the protocol? The pointer pass back or something? Like that. Oh, yeah, there was, I can't remember what it was. There was some really evil thing that actually did this on purpose. Oh, okay. um, it was they trusted both sides, and they sent pointers. Anyway, yeah. So one more quick question. So you're saying that the, if you run this um, real user's desktop, there will be false positives. So it should not be run on real user's desktop to catch work. Uh, I don't think there would be a problem with false positives, really. You think the, they use their own virtual machine just in time compiler. Any software, there can be a legitimate use of this. Uh, yeah, the only false, it depends on whether you call it false positive or not, but the policy of, because uh, we're, we're, we're tagging network data as untrusted, so if they download a program and then run it, uh, it depends on whether you have the kernel managing that or not, whether they can, if you just download it and run it, and it doesn't, uh, it, it just sits in the, you know, memory buffers as low integrity, then I guess you could call that a false positive, depending on what the policy is. So. Okay, but if you apply to Honeypot, you actually don't care about false positive that much because most of the things you can prove is true positive. Therefore, the things yeah. that you are, cannot <clears throat> confirm is very rare cases anyway, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you you built this on top of Box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much work would it be to build it on top of a to to modify kind of a more of a traditional virtual machine implementation to also use this to uh, provide the same data? Yeah, I think the, the the issue is that for every instruction, if there is you know integrity bits to be propagated, if anything's low integrity, then you you have to do that propagation. So you basically have to emulate the instruction. But there was there was a paper in Eurocrypt, I think last year, where they had a ChemU, which is sort of a much faster version of Box, where you're doing emulation of the instructions, and then Zen. And then they use demand emulation so that they only run in ChemU when uh, when you're actually needing to propagate tag bits. But then most of the time, everything is high integrity, so you can run it in Zen, and they got uh, near native performance doing it that way. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you try to download JavaScript and, and run on top of that? I, um, yeah. well, my question is uh, whether uh, when you download the JavaScript, whether the, the the taint bit will propagate uh, to to the control data. Uh, yeah. So for Java, we we added a compatibility mode in in Linux, and it turns out if the source of the uh, you know what's being compiled with a just-in-time compiler is high integrity, then the results of the just-in-time compiler will be high integrity. The the reason we had to do a compatibility mode is that for for various reasons we made 8-bit and 16-bit immediates, which are, you know, the constants in your program, basically. The immediates, if we made those low integrity, then there's one attack that we need to do that to catch. But if you make those low integrity in, uh, you know, Sun Virtual Machine, for example, then it uses 8-bit and 16-bit immediates to calculate, you know, jump targets and stuff. So it ended up causing false positives. So that's why we added the compatibility mode and then Windows, we run in compatibility mode all the time. So all 8 and 16-bit immediates, the constants are high integrity all the time. So, to yeah. Asking about JavaScript, which is the yeah, yeah, Java. Yeah. Oh, JavaScript. JavaScript, yeah. yeah client-side honeypot, basically. Can I use this in client-side honeypot? Oh, yeah, client-side honeypot, yeah. Well, there's an issue that JavaScript's fully interpreted, so. Yeah, you, you would only catch low-level attacks. You can't catch things at a higher level of abstraction than Minos is working at, so. So it doesn't violate. Uh, the, your invariant. So yeah, for any interpreted language. Yeah. It's not really. Right. That's just another kind of non control flow ordering attack. Right. Yeah. 
just doesn't capture them. Yeah, so th this is all a very low level of abstraction, so we're looking at uh, control data. Okay. <laughs> and okay, so we're going to use Dakota to understand the, the amount of polymorphism metamorphism that's available in it to the attacker. And so we're, we're going to try to discover invariance in the exploit vector. And we're going to do this with symbolic execution. As the server is being exploited, we're going to run symbolic execution on the web server code that's running or whatever kind of server is being attacked and discover the invariance. I'll, I'll talk about how predicate discovery works. And we use this as an empirical analysis of polymorphism and metamorphism. So there have been you know, some statements in the literature like, you know, every worm must have more than 40 byte of, you know, 40 byte contiguous string of invariant content. And so we wanted to evaluate that and actually quantify for different worms and different attacks whether that was true or not. And so what, what's the big difference between worm polymorphism and metamorphism and virus polymorphism and metamorphism? So here I'm just going to use the terms worm and virus sort of loosely. So virus is something that spreads through your file system and spreads slowly and worms, you know, go faster over the network. So the virus is the defender has time to pick apart the attacker's techniques. And no, no matter how polymorphic and metamorphic you make your virus, they can analyze it and then find some weakness and then write an algorithmic scanner or use emulation to, to be able to detect it. With worms, it's not just that they're faster, but we have to deploy the defenses before they, you know, send out the attack. So the, the roles have sort of changed. The defender can pick apart the defenses and find the weaknesses in the defenses. So what, what can defenders to do, what, what can they do to evaluate the robustness of defenses for attacks that don't exist yet? And that's the kind of question we're going to try to answer with Dakota. So there, there was a project at San Diego and actually with some collaborators here at Microsoft Research where they found relatively little polymorphism in the wild. So it's not like you can just take all these samples of polymorphic and metamorphic worms that we've seen and be able to analyze, you know, <coughs> how are we going to deal with these. And part of the reason that we don't have all these samples is we haven't built the defenses yet. So why would attackers be writing polymorphic and metamorphic worms when the, the defenses haven't really been developed yet? So that's why instead of looking at the network packets, back to our epsilon gamma pi model, uh, instead of looking at network traces and finding out what's invariant, we're going to uh, use Dakota on the, the, the trace that the web server follows when it's being attacked or whatever kind of server is being attacked. And then we're going to discover invariance along that trace. And that will tell us the limits of polymorphism and metamorphism, you know, even if the attack isn't polymorphic and metamorphic. So how this works is based on the, uh, the insight. The information only has meaning and it's subject to interpretation. So we're going to use symbolic execution to see how the network data is interpreted. So Dakota will label each byte of network data with a unique label. So the first byte gets one, second byte gets two, and then it tracks those through the entire system and discovers predicates about how the host under attack interprets the network byte. So it's if, a, if it's a web server and it's looking for GET for you know, the GET request, then we'll discover a predicate for G equal to G equal to E equal to T. So the way this works, you know, this is x86 assembly. So obviously if you label a byte as you move it around in registers and memory, the label will just follow the byte. And then if you add two things and one of them or both of them are labeled, then you just create a new expression. So you create an add expression. <coughs> And the way predicate discovery works is if you compare two things, then we associate the, the left and the right of the flag with the expressions for the two things you compared. And if you subsequently do a, a conditional jump based on that comparison, you know, for example, we, we can discover the predicate now that those two things had to be equal for you to follow that trace through the code. And that's how we're going to discover invariance. And why was full system analysis important for Dakota? One thing is that these buffer overflows could be in the kernel. You don't even have to talk to a process. You can just open you know, a, a TCP connection right to the kernel, and there's various vulnerabilities there. And even if, you know, for, like for the LSAS worm, even if the buffer overflow isn't in the kernel, you're talking to the kernel for a large part of the protocol. And a lot of them go through multiple processes. We saw attacks that went through as many as five different processes on the way to the one that had the buffer overflow. And this is an example where the web server might take something that's base64 encoded and unencode it before passing it on to lsas.exe, which has a, uh, a double free vulnerability in it. So you, you have to look at what's going on in multiple processes to really understand you know, how the attack is working. <coughs>
And multi-threading is another thing you need to think about because most of these attacks are on servers like the SQL server that's uh, you know multi-threaded and listening on multiple ports. So I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there some previous technique that doesn't handle multi-threading well that you're that you're comparing this to? Uh, not necessarily multi-thread, multi-processes and kernel. So uh, there's taint check and vigilante both will attach to a process. So if the web server process is going to be attacked, then they, you know, attach to the process and do binary rewrite on the process. And if you do that, then you know, worms like Sasser or Zotob don't really work that way. You're, you're actually going through the kernel and using named pipes and things to. And. So these are the actual worms and attacks that we caught with Minos Analyze with Dakota. Most of them are buffer overflows. So like I said, Zotob, Code Red, Slammer, Blaster, Saster, and then we also want to look at attacks that weren't buffer overflows and attacks for other systems. I have a quick question okay. about the multiple process. If there are two processes, they need the, the I mean, user kernel to communicate. If I use Vigilante, can I just attach Vigilante to both process? Would that work? Uh, you know that yeah, I just assume assume that it would that work. Uh, I suppose it, it, like if they're communicating through IPC through the kernel, uh -huh. then if one process is going to you know read something off the network and send it through IPC to another process, I don't know how you would track through that inter-process communication. But so depends on if they treat the IPC, I mean the bytes coming from IPC as a malicious, I mean suspicious input. Yeah. Okay. okay, so yeah, we looked at some Linux and BSD attacks, and then, so in terms of the invariance that Dakota discovers, one question you might ask is, what's the longest string of contiguous bytes that has to be there for the attack to work? And so we looked at that for the, the 13 uh, exploits, and you can see that only one of these has more than 40 bytes of, of a contiguous byte string that has to be there for the attack to work. And why is the number 40 important? Because both Autograph and Early Bird, these are projects where they're looking for the same string going from multiple hosts to multiple destinations, and that's how they detect worms. They both demonstrated good results at about 40 bytes for the signature length. So. It, it, for this won't work for 12 of the 13 attacks that we looked at with Dakota. And uh, so a group at Carnegie Mellon came to the same conclusion as we did. So they proposed sets of smaller uh, byte strings called tokens. What time do I need to stop? Is it enough? Okay. And so these tokens back. Okay, that should be fine. Okay, great. So the, the, the tokens would be, back to our code red example, this would be you know, the, these little strings that have to be there for the attack to follow the same trace. And uh, so obviously one problem would be metamorphism. If you use those a, as your signature, then there's different ways to, to attack the code red vulnerability. Uh, and then you also have to ask, where do these tokens come from? So most of them are just... Uh, they, they don't describe the vulnerability really. There's no token there that says this is a buffer overflow. They're really just describing the protocol framing that you go through to get to that condition. So for example, the scalper, the only uh, token that separates it from normal HTTP traffic is this transfer encoding chunk, but that's a valid part of the HTTP protocol. This is actually the signature that, that Snort uses, and the only reason you don't get false positives is because nobody is using you know, this particular part of the HTTP protocol. And the same thing applies to most of these vulnerabilities. Those invariants are all the protocol framing. They have nothing to do with the uh, vulnerability. So this sort of puts you on the horns of a dilemma. You can either use that protocol framing as your signature and then say, uh, you know, we're just going to assume that there aren't that many buffer overflows and well-exercised code. So therefore, this must be a part of the protocol we can just shut off. Or you need to be very precise. And the problem with being very precise is, for example, there's this one. Uh, ASN.1 is basically XML for binary. So this exploit, it's a heap corruption exploit. And you get heap corruption whenever you're building a constructed bit string. So the byte 23 means I'm going to build a constructed bit string. And you build sort of this tree structure. And if at any point the, the size of the string so far is equal to the size in bits of what you're adding, then you get heap corruption. So you can see how extremely metamorphic this attack could be. And there's absolutely no byte string that will describe it. And so it, it would be hard to have that kind of precision unless you really understand the vulnerability through program analysis or something.
So related work, Vigilante, they uh, introduced the idea of self-certifying alerts. So you, you catch an attack and then you want to prove to other people that this attack is going on. So their goal was automatic patching. They wanted to, to patch and then release the patches, not network filtering. So they don't make the distinction that we did between what data looks like on the network and what it looks like when it's processed. And the, their filter generation is similar to Dakota's symbolic execution, but they do it on a single process. So it's not a whole system approach like Dakota. And then Shield is, you know, looking at a lot of the same things. There should be a sub bullet there with all the, you know, follow on works like Shield Gen and <laughs> and Gappa, but you know, looking at the same sort of issues with the exploit and how you can exploit vulnerabilities in different ways. Can so you more about the line about vigilante, no distinction between what data looks like on the network and what it looks like on the process. Could you um what what's the implication yeah I got a little bit so I'm trying to. Or we can take that. Yeah, so, okay, probably. Is, is this a shortcoming of vigilante? It does it. Is it? Why do they not have to solve that think, problem? Uh, yeah, I think what I'm trying to say with this slide is that they were solving a different problem than they were. They were. Uh, they, they, you know, they were trying to patch and then do the self-certifying alert. Whereas with Dakota, even though we're we're doing the same sort of thing they did, our goal was more to look, at, you know, study the network traffic and what could be invariant in the network traffic. So. It's you know two very similar solutions to two different problems. I think. <laughs> my, my impression is when, when you do a formal analysis of of the code, uh, I believe the uh, symbolic execution is is uh, one type of uh, formal analysis. Mm -hmm. So the the most difficult part is uh, to come up with a, a, a loop invariant to to, uh, to to capture the real signature. So. My my impression is when when you do this, very often you will uh, you will see a lot of loops to yeah. to, to parse the the strings. Mm -hmm. and then how do you deal with that loop? Uh, so we we don't deal with that with Dakota because Dakota we're we're not trying to sell it as you know a signature generation scheme where we can actually generate signatures. We it's more of an empirical study, you know, of other signature generation schemes and how much invariant content would be there for them to uh, be able to handle. And then for future work, I'll talk about future work where we do want to look at that kind of, so that would be metamorphism. If you go through a loop a different number of times then you're following a different trace. Whereas with Dakota we're doing uh, symbolic execution on a single trace so it only tells us about that one attack that we've seen and then we, we can't generalize to other attacks from that. Okay, so the conclusions, whole system analysis is important. So we have data in the paper about how many different processes in the kernel uh, different attacks go through. And then now that now us and then some other researchers are focusing on more semantic signatures. So how do you actually understand the semantics of the vulnerability and then use that either as a signature on the host or on the network? Uh, but uh, the, the most important thing to take away from Dakota in this talk is that we can learn a lot about emerging malware threats by studying the existing threats and their interactions with the systems that they're running on. And then so we can understand, you know, threats that we haven't seen before. And now I'll talk about temporal search, which this is more on the pi stage. You can think of uh, Minos as being in the gamma stage and Dakota was in the epsilon stage. Now we're going to look at the pi stage. So this is the code that the worm runs or the virus, you know, after it's spread. And we want to discover time bomb attacks. We want to know, is this counting down to some event in the future where it's going to delete all of your files or download updates to itself? And this is a prototype of behavior-based analysis, which is a relatively, you know, unresearched area compared to uh, appearance-based, which is you're looking for worm signatures and things. Uh, so we're proposing a framework for a problem space nobody has looked at before, which is finding time bomb attacks. We've implemented parts of it, so we have a semi-automated implementation. A human still has to do parts of the process I'm going to describe. And then we identified the remaining challenges before you could actually build a, uh, a fully automated temporal search. So to motivate the problem, suppose you're an antivirus professional, you catch a new worm, and you want to know, does it have a time bomb attack? Is it going to delete everybody's files in a half hour? So first you have to unpack it so they have different ways of zipping it up and then they always change the packer just a little bit so that you always have to figure out 
you know what what the trick is to unpack it and then you can have polymorphism metamorphism this is in the you know more general virus sense where you're doing binary rewriting on the code and then anti debugger tricks so they throw floating point exceptions that your debugger might not be able to handle to try to keep you from analyzing the code and you have to get through all this before you can even ask the question are there any behaviors predicated on time and then you want to know how does it get the time does it use a system call or does it just read the time from uh you know the system time that's mapped into the process, the address space of every process, and what what kind of format it is. Is it broken up in a day, hour, minute, or is it one single integer counting seconds from 1970? Is it UTC local? And then a, a lot of these worms that we looked at did conversions between formats, uh, you know, not using the standard library functions, but they had their own code to convert between various formats. So by the time you've done all this, it's too late. And <laughs> So that's why we propose temporal search. With temporal search, you would just infect a virtual machine, or if the virtual machine is a honeypot, it would get infected on its own. And then you run an automated behavior-based analysis technique called temporal search, and then you can respond in some way once you know what the time bot attack is going to be. So what do I mean by respond? For sober.x, they were able to, uh, sober.x was set to download updates to itself on the 6th and 7th of January, and they found about this months ahead of time, so they just blocked the URLs that it was going to download the updates from. And Kama Sutra was set to delete the files on uh, the user's machines the third of every month. And they were able to avert this by getting the news out. Once people found out their fires going to be deleted, then they just uh, removed the infections themselves. And like I said, Code Red uh, attempted a denial of service on the White House on the 20th of the month. And they, they were able to just change the IP address and, and respond to that. So the question is, for, for all of these examples, there were days but that they had to figure out what was going on. But what if we have just hours or even minutes? And that's where behavior-based analysis comes in. So just to define behavior-based analysis, Cohen defined behavior-based detection as a question. If you define what is and is not a legitimate use of a service, and then you find some means of detecting the difference. And behavior-based analysis is similar, except that we're going to assume that the system is infected with malware. We already know that it's a worm or a virus, and we just want to analyze its use of some service, such as the programmable interval timer. So this is a timer in the x86 hardware that just interrupts the processor at a fixed rate, like a 1,000 times a second, and then systems keep track of time by counting those interrupts. And you might be wondering, why not just speed up the clock? We'll just infect a virtual machine on January 1st, and then we'll speed the clock up and see what happens. We'll just run it like 100 times the rate of normal time. So one problem is that it, it's really easy for a worm or a virus to detect that you're running time at you know, 100 times the rate of normal time. And then another problem is it's not easy to do for a busy system because you, you're effectively lowering perceived performance. So uh, you know, the, the Windows kernel might think that it's taking much longer than it should for a kernel thread to complete, and you'll get a blue screen if you try to go too fast. But more importantly, you might miss some behaviors. So for the Kama Sutra worm, it, it does check if it's the third of the month and then delete your files. But it only does this either a half hour after the initial infection or a half hour after you reboot. So only a half hour after Kama Sutra starts running does it actually check the date. So if you just infect a virtual machine on the first of the year and then speed time way up, then you're just going to go through all the third of the months and you're never going to see this behavior. And even if you do elicit a behavior, you won't be able to describe why did that happen. So if something happens, you know, on the 7th, did that happen because it was the second Tuesday, or did that happen because seven days passed, or because it was the 7th? So with uh, temporal search, we're actually, through symbolic execution, we're going to be able to track the computation of exactly what predicate is it using to predicate the time behavior. So this is the basic idea of how temporal search works. First, we want to find the timer. So there's various system timers, or the malware could set up its own timer. And uh, so there's this well-known architecture paper called SimPoints, where they show that, you know, like for the spec benchmarks, for example, there's a very regular behavior for, you know, particular variables being updated. So we don't want to view those as timers. We only want the things that actually depend on time. So we we speed up the virtual machine's perceived rate of time just a little bit, and we slow it down just a little bit. And the system performance will stay the same, so we can correlate between the pit and the memory writes, the rate of the memory writes. And then we can find candidate timers. And through symbolic execution, we can find out, is this just a semaphore on the timer, or is this actually the timer we're looking for?
and then you would do symbolic execution with something like Dakota once you found that timer, say it's the system time timer in Windows, you would do symbolic execution from that memory location and then if, if through a system call it's red and then there's some predicate after some computations is this equal to 20, then you'll discover that predicate with Dakota. And then we worked with some programming language researchers and they, they came up with the weakest precondition analysis. Once you see that predicate, something's equal to 20, you have to work backwards and find out exactly what it was calculating. So we do that with the weakest precondition analysis that works backwards on the trace. <coughs> so it's an example of this. So uh, the system time timer counts hecto nanoseconds since 1600. And at first I thought this was, you know, in case you want to import from your Babbage machine into an Excel spreadsheet or something. But then I realized it's, uh, we, we actually switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar in 1587, I believe. So we skipped a few days in October. So this is as far back as you want to go before the computations get really hairy. And so you have some integer for the system time timer, some 64-bit integer. This corresponds to the 13th of July when Code Red was introduced. And then through symbolic execution, we'll discover some predicate. So it's comparing something that's based on the system time timer to 20. And its behavior right now is that it's spreading. It's sending out probes to port 80 and trying to spread. So what we use weakest precondition analysis to work backwards from that predicate to the new integer for system time that will cause that predicate to be true. And uh, so we get some new integer. And this happens to correspond to the 20th of July, which is when it'll start doing a denial of service on the White House. And then we'll discover a new predicate. So now it's looking for 28 instead of 20. So we use weakest precondition analysis. And we find out that corresponds to the 28th of July. And then we can fill in a timetable of the, the worm's behavior this way. So for Windows XP, what do we do uh, with those predicates that we discover? So this is the number of predicates discovered by Dakota for both tick count and system time. Tick count is sort of internal timekeeping. So if you say wait a half hour like the Kama Sutra worm does, that's tick count. And then system time is the actual date and time. So you can f see for system time, there's not much going on. So we can profile that out, all of the normal system behavior. We can just profile it out. Those little spikes are just that little clock on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen in Windows. But for tick count, it's not just that there's so much going on, but it's going on all over the kernel. So if we want to do temporal search on tick count instead of system time, then we would need you know, more sophisticated ways of filtering out the malware behavior than what we have now. So we focused on system time for, for our purposes. And then, uh, so w what if you had to do manual analysis? So we actually did manual analysis on six worms. And they use all kinds of different library calls and APIs. So you can get local time, or you can get it as uh, UTC, and then get the time zone information and convert it yourself. You don't even really need a system call because the system time timer is mapped in the address space of every process in Windows XP, so you can just read it. You don't need to do a system call. And then there's all these conversions between different representations, and a lot of these worms are uh, doing these conversions themselves. They're not using the standard library functions, and you can't even get out of all this until you unpack it and deal with all the anti debugging tricks. Metamorphism, metamorphism, but all of it is just data flow from the system time timer. So this is what temporal search does, is it just skips all of this. And on a virtual machine, we're just going to do symbolic execution from the system time timer. So for our semi-automated evaluation of uh, uh, temporal search, we, we ran a box virtual machine with Dakota on timer discovery. We gave it a local IP address and then the host has its IP address, and then it's running various services the worm might be looking for, you know, DNS, HTTP, NTP. And uh, then a lot of these worms are wanting to talk to specific IP addresses on the internet or specific domain names. So we just do ARP cache poisoning, DNS spoofing, IP spoofing, whatever we have to do on the TunTap interface to get the worm to actually run and think that it's actually running on the internet. And so for... Uh, we, we used Dakota as our symbolic execution engine, and then for four of the six worms we looked at, we were able to discover any predicates on the day or the hour or minute or anything lower granularity than a day. And then we concluded that to handle months and years because of the way months and years are calculated using while loops. And right now, Dakota doesn't have any control flow sensitivity to the way that it does symbolic execution. And we would need to have that control flow sensitivity to, to discover predicates on the month and the year. And also for the two worms that were written in Visual Basic, because Visual Basic dates are strings, we would need more control flow sensitivity to handle those. <coughs>
in terms of an adversarial analysis, there's more details in the paper about you know, what, what if an attacker knows about temporal search and they want to evade your analysis. But I just want to point out that for any technique, it's not a requirement that you can apply it to every possible virus or worm that somebody could write. The only requirement is that uh, it, it's a useful technique that can be applied when it's appropriate to apply it and the, the, the analyzers know the limitations of the technique. So our conclusions from temporal search. Manual analysis is tricky and time consuming, but temporal search can dramatically improve your response time. And we found that beha with behavior-based analysis, it's all about the environment. So if your environment isn't complex enough to elicit the behaviors that you're looking for, then you'll, you'll uh, come to the wrong conclusion. For, for example, for code red, we had initially concluded it only checks the date once, and then it either does a denial of service or spreads, and it never checks the date again. But that's because we weren't resetting outgoing TCP connections. So it, the threads were hanging, waiting for their TCP responses. And if you actually you know, run on the real internet where it's getting responses from the HTTP, then the thread will come back and we'll check it. So you have to have an environment that's complex enough. Also, we found that malware doesn't follow a linear timetable. So we modeled mal you know, worms as you know, this happens at this time, and that happens at that time, and that happens at that time. But like we saw with the Kama Sutra worm, uh, a lot of times they, they have a more complex interaction between behavior and time. So for future work, we would want to use a richer model, something like finite state transition systems. And we also found that the Gregorian calendar posed its own challenges, which is why we had to do the weakest precondition analysis. And just a parting thought on behavior-based analysis. This is Herbert Simon. And what he's talking about is there's an ant walking along the beach and has some complex path that goes over twigs and around Coke cans and you know, across little valleys of sand, and he's saying that the, the apparent complexity of its behavior over time is more a reflection of the beach than it is of the ant. So this is what behavior-based analysis is all about, is we want to bring the complexities of the environment into the results of the analysis. And right now... So that the malware can also bring new environment into the environment that you may be assuming. Yeah. <laughs> um, it feels like the behavior-based analysis it seems to point the tie to arms race with the malware authors. Like you, you roughly know the kind of basically you have the assumption on what kind of environment they run in <laughs> and what kind of possible behavior they may have then to detect them. Yeah. But once the malware authors know about these, they could break out this environment, add a new environment. For example, they could use a, use IRC doing this kind of asking commander to coordinate the timing. Yeah. What about nice rather than using timing-based uh, way of doing Yes, I, I think that's pretty much true of any malware analysis, not just behavior-based, but even appearance-based is the same thing. If they know what you're looking for, then they can evade it. So. Okay. And then I'll, I'll just talk about some other recent projects really quickly before I get into future work. So this is stuff, mostly if, you, if you're interested in this, just talk to me offline. So we have one project where we're using virtual machines to uh, test the mutual information between an input that might be confidential and an output that, that you know, is a, a lower classification. And then we have some results about how you, you would be able to enumerate every single possible covert channel if you do things this way. So if, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, then you can talk to me about that offline. We also have a project where we're, we have an infrastructure to send dirty words over to China and then collect the reset packets that come back. And then we want to reverse engineer the rule set, the list of words that they're looking for to do filtering. So my contribution is, to this has been to, uh, to relate keywords to concepts using something called latent semantic analysis. So this would be for like, you know, uh, sort of semantics based web search or something. So we would take keywords that we know are blocked and then we would look for words that are related to the same concept and test those first. So we're trying to do uh, more efficient probing to discover new words so we don't have to take the whole dictionary and test the whole dictionary. So if you're interested in that, I can talk about that offline. And we also have a uh, recovery project that's sort of fault tolerance. This is a, a junior student. She's about second year or third year. So Minus will detect an attack, and then we can analyze it with Dakota. And then we do deterministic replay as far as we can, and then we do what we call semi-replay after that. And the idea is that even if it's a buffer overflow and like a multi-threaded process where clients are trying to do things, or if it's a buffer overflow in the kernel or something, we can recover and make it look to the clients as if nothing had ever happened, even though there's that period between when the attack starts 
and, and you know, memory is being corrupted, and then when it's detected, we can undo that through the semi-replay. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I can talk about that offline. So now looking ahead in general, we have these, you know, emerging threats, worms, botnets, root kits, and I put question marks there because who knows what's going to come up in the future. And these aren't problems with purely technical solutions. You can't just solve them like an equation. So I feel we should give defenders the tools they need, both in terms of implementations of techniques they can actually use, and then in terms of theory that they can apply to the situations they face. And how do we develop defenses for emerging threats? So I always try to study real malware and real attacks and then do that on a full system so we can understand the systems that this battle is taking place on and then use the interactions between the two to develop a theory of what's possible even though we don't have samples of the advanced attacks. So some specific examples of future work I'd like to do uh, in terms of behavior-based analysis. Uh, I'd like to do a fully automated implementation of temporal search and then look at various ways. It turns out we weren't really the first pr people to look at this kind of problem. There was a, a, a Y2K paper that looked at path profiling so that there's different things that we can look at in temporal search and also cryptovirological attacks where they're using you know advanced encryption techniques to hide what a botnet or a worm or something is doing if we can use the uh, you know the entropy based measurement that I showed you before for something like that and in terms of vulnerability semantics understanding the semantics of you know uh, uh, of an attack on a vulnerability so like I said with Dakota we get one trace and then we have one trace of predicates that have to be true to follow that trace and then what we'd like to know is which of those predicates actually say this is a buffer overflow or this is double free so we're looking at latent semantic analysis which is you know, sort of like corpus summary, a document summary, and then we should be able to take, you know, sort of like a, an encyclopedia of attacks we've seen in the past and then summarize, you know, what is related to the concept of a buffer overflow and what is, uh, you know, related to a double free. And then we can use those for testing for unknown vulnerabilities or for signature generation, all kinds of different things. And then also uh, policies for commodity systems. So there was a paper by Timothy Frazier where he said that certain policies, and the two he pointed out were Chinese wall policy, which is kind of a conflict of interest policy, and then BIBA's low watermark integrity, which is what we used for Minos. These policies sort of write the policy as you go along. So all accesses are based on accesses that you've made in the past, and that makes them particularly suitable for commodity systems. So we applied the low watermark integrity policy in Minos to control data attacks. And I want to look at what kinds of other protections like against rootkits or things like that can we do with these kinds of policies so that they apply to commodity systems. And with that, thanks for inviting me and I'll take any questions.